Okay, so let's go on. So just to, uh, I think, very kind of Wai Chong to have promoted me. Actually, I'm not the deputy CMB. I'm deputy CEO in charge of education and community partnerships in Sing Health Community Hospitals, which is only a part of the largest Sing Health. I have uh, since completed my term in as president of the College of Family Physician. Now I'm helping out as the assistant master of academic affairs in the Academy of Medicine. So these are some of the official things that I, I do. But I think the the greatest fun and more interesting part is really what I really believe in. And I think I can say why Chong also believe in is actually uh, family medicine, but in the greater context of the community and how that is really the thing that we should all emphasize on. So uh, I'll just take you through this. Like I said, why social prescribing? What is social prescribing? And as a clinician, what does it mean to you? Or do you need to participate? And if you want to, how can you participate? Okay, let's go on. Uh oh, the slide is not moving. Uh, so why social prescribing? Okay, now I think it is social prescribing has been around. It's only around 2014, 2015 that it become really uh, formalized as a as an idea or a model of care. So, uh, but of course, this is a worldwide trend. You know, it's not just in Singapore that everyone believes that healthcare by itself is not enough. We need health and social care to come together. And when you think deeply about what this healthier SG about is all about, it's actually an evolution of our healthcare system from policy to policy. So let's examine healthier SG first, and then, then I can also then uh, link you back to this concept of social prescribing. So uh, I think no, bet no one better than our own Minister of Health to re-explain to us. We can leverage GPs to SG. attend to more patients, not for coughs and colds, but devoting time to provide preventive care. MOH will support this by building up the clinic's capabilities, such as telemedicine and IT systems. We will work with GPs to develop the skills of clinic healthcare team and forge partnerships with hospitals to deliver more integrated team-based care. So as you can see, there are lots of doctors in the primary care and the primary care essentially is in the community. They are not inside the hospital. They are in the clinic, especially the GPs. They are really right smack in the middle and the depth of our community. Uh, but unfortunately, the way the healthcare is organized, they are sort of uh, not really organized as part of community health or even public health, which I think doesn't leverage on the capability and potential. So Healthier SG really is a timely a return to this very foundational thing about family medicine, which is how do we get family doctors to help? Because they are the they are the doctors who are really in the community. So it's part of past one of the key thing in healthy SG is to mobilize family doctors, those in the GP as well as those in the polyclinic, to take a more community approach and give them that resourcing and the and the, and the means to contribute to the community part of health. So that's the second element. The second component of Healthier SG is healthcare plans. Seeing our family doctor for preventive care is different from the occasional visit to their clinics when we don't feel well. It means regular scheduled check-ins at least once a year so that the family doctor can assess your overall health condition, conduct necessary health screenings, track your results, administer vaccinations if need be, advise you on an adjustments in lifestyles to help you achieve your health goals. And this is especially useful if you are at risk of developing a chronic condition like diabetes. A care plan can help prevent it. So you see, when we go on holiday, now is the holiday season again. We always plan, right? Where do we go? Where do we want to go? Book the hotel, airplane, we plan, 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 then we carry out. Then things don't go well, we end up with a bad holiday. When it comes to health, it's like a lifelong journey. Uh, we actually don't have a plan, which is quite shocking, right? Uh, so now we need to have a health healthcare plan. And you, the old ways, what we do is we just go by the seat of our pants. I mean, as, speaking as a patient, right? If you have a fever, cough, and you think it's not that urgent, you go and see your GP. 
and Singapore is very good. You don't even need an appointment. Uh, you can just drop by and the GP will attend to you. And then if you have an accident, you go to the A&E. And then if you don't get an accident, you just continue to go your own way. You don't know what you're going to do with your health. And then if you have something that you think is very serious, then you say, oh, too serious. Let's go and see a specialist. What specialist? If someone in the stomach, then go and see a gastroenterologist. Uh, headache, maybe go and see a neurologist. You know, and it's this kind of uh, haphazard approach to using a healthcare system that is actually not sustainable, nor is, nor is it very wise or cost effective. So everybody should have a healthcare plan and know exactly where to go for what services even before something happened. So that will be the ideal state. Huh? So health plan, healthcare plan, of course, includes regular health checks and vaccinations and so on. All this kind of maintenance thing, right? nobody maintains uh, our body. In fact, it's uh, quite a joke that I think we probably maintain our car better than we maintain our body. At least the car, you go for regular checks, right? So I think this is part of this healthcare plan that is so essential that it, that will make our population healthier and the healthcare system more sustainable. The second component. All right, so let's go to the third component now. Our third component is that we then need community partnerships. Preventive care plans involve lifestyle adjustments, which needs to happen outside of the clinics and in our living environments. Doctors have a name for this. They call this social prescriptions as opposed to drug prescriptions. We therefore need the support of agencies, many of them, HPB, AIC, PA, Sports SG, NPB, Park Sport, and community partners that oversee various social services. They run various activities and programs in the community, which we then get family doctors to tap on. So there you go. We hear about social prescribing. Uh, and I think more and more you will hear this term. But uh, what exactly does it mean? It just means something in the community, very important, part of healthy energy. But what does it really is and mean? We will delve in a little bit later. But at least now we should, I hope you're convinced that it is actually part of this mainstream concept that we need to ad adopt and implement in order to achieve a healthier population for our country. Okay, so it is happening in the community because we know healthcare cannot be delivered entirely by hospitals and clinics or even by doctors, nurses, therapists, and what have you who works in the healthcare environment. We need things in the community to complete the plan, right? So let's, we'll go into a bit later when we talk about what is social prescribing. Then the final element, which is just- We will roll out a national healthier SG enrollment program. That's when I mentioned, by enrolling into healthier SG, a resident will commit to see one family doctor and adopt one care plan. The national enrollment program will be coordinated by our three healthcare clusters. Each will look after a region of up to about 1.5 million residents and work with the family doctors and other partners in the region to reach out to as many residents as possible. I want to specifically highlight the importance of this collaboration between healthcare clusters and the family doctors. It is a very important nexus because the family doctors will receive support from hospitals in looking after residents with more complex needs. Then hospitals, after discharging a patient, can refer them back to the family doctor. So this is the part, how to make things happen, right? Which is very challenging. We need the necessary support structures to make healthier SG work. And this is actually no small matter. Manpower is a big part of this. Finance is another major support system. We have been funding our healthcare clusters largely by their workload, such as the number of treatments, number of surgeries and operations. We will change this to a capitation model where healthcare clusters get a predetermined fee for every resident living in the region that they are looking after. The last critical support structure is IT. Family doctors in the front line of Healthy SG will need good system and data support. They must have access to patients' medical records. 
they must have the IT tools to track the patient's conditions and progress over time. They must also be able to share their records with other providers, other healthcare providers. We want to work towards a scenario that no matter where you are receiving care, for example, at the GP or dental clinics, polyclinics, hospitals, SOCs, nursing homes, elder care centers, the same data can be retrieved to support your care. And that is why MOH has been enhancing and rolling out the NEHR, the National Electronic Health Records System. Yeah. So you see, when we talk about making things happen, right, you must always have manpower. You got to have dollars, money, and you need to have the infrastructure to support it. So that's for uh, when they want to implement healthier SG, all these are taken into consideration, which shows that people are really determined and serious about this. This is not just a, 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 a speech, a few good kind of speech, but really did serious about carrying it out. So these are the five elements and uh, social prescribing is in the middle of the whole thing. Now again, then we go, what is social prescribing? And before that, so many of you here are actually family physicians like myself. So when we were trained, they would say, okay, uh, a heart doctor is called cardiologist. Uh, stomach and intestine doctor is called gastroenterologist. So family medicine, what do you treat? Do you treat the family? So we are not uh, defined by the organ that we treat. We are also not defined by uh, specifically uh, the kind of age group that a person will come and see us, like say pediatrics or geriatrics even. We see everybody from young to old. We always proudly say it's cradle to grave. So what is it about? Is it family medicine? So experts around the world, when family medicine was first formed as a specialty or discipline, came to the conclusion that family medicine is actually a way of practicing medicine that is focused or specialized on the person, regardless of age, gender, or uh, where they live or where they stay, right? So uh, they say there are six key elements inside. The care is personal, is very primary, meaning that it's the starting point of a person's health journey. It is preventive, always thinking about how to prevent things from going wrong rather than just treat things when they become when they are actually wrong. Comprehensive is, is very all-inclusive. Everything of concern to the patient is, should be the concern of the family doctor as well. It's continuing. It doesn't stop outside the clinic. Neither does it end after the clinic. Or does it? So now then the other thing is it has to be coordinated because the patient goes through a very complex system of care once he leaves our clinic and we have to think about how to coordinate all these needs. Huh? So of course family medicine is practiced in many settings in Singapore, uh, mainly in the primary care which is GPs and polyclinics. Uh, quite a number of them now work in community hospitals, acute hospitals even and hospices. So this is really the concept of family medicine. Now if you look at it then you will find that there's a lot of relevant relevance, right? Because when we say personal care, personal means it must be unique to an individual, right? And everybody's health plan should be different based on their risk factors, based on what is important to them in their life and so on. So everyone should have a personalized one care plan that they have. Primary means that that's where they start the journey when they need to seek help from the healthcare system. And I think two ministers or maybe three ministers back when Mr. Common One was the minister, he had this vision and he encouraged us to say, every Singaporean should have their own family doctor. So I think everyone agrees this is a good idea. But how do you make it happen? I think we have been gradually inching closer and closer to this idealized state. But right now, I think with Healthy SG, we are dead serious. We want to enroll every Singapore resident and citizen to a family doctor. So preventive, as you just heard the minister say in the first uh, key point, he said, not just for minor cough and colds. There are so much more that family doctors and GPs can do, and we want them to be able to do that. Comprehensive means inclusive of everything, including checkups, vaccination, chronic disease management, acute minor illnesses, acute serious illnesses, and also, very importantly, social prescribing. Then continuing, you heard about how we want to link the RHS to the GPs and primary care. We also want to link the RHS, the GPs and the polyclinic doctors to the community care providers out there as well. 
and then we want to everyone to be coordinated in our effort. Uh, and the RHS now is going to deploy place-based care teams. That means teams of care coordinators, uh, people who do social prescribing, as well as community nurses uh, into the community to support this coordination of care as well. So I think the plan is really exciting. So let's find out what is social prescribing in detail. Eh? Okay, so always comes with a definition, but you'll find the definition has an issue because sometimes definition can oversimplify things. So for example, how do you define myself, Li Keng Hock? So we have this a few liners, or oh, he works here, he's the past president, he's so and so, very good, very good, right? But is that really the person, Li Keng Hock? So same thing for social prescribing. So what we are giving here is like a a short intro of the essentials of what is social prescribing. But the concept itself is so much more than this. Huh? But let's try to do that. So way back uh, in the twenty mid 2010s, uh, uh, social prescribing become a very commonly used term. So there's this uh, think tank in UK called the King's Fund. So they are very academic. So they say, let's define something so that we can all be on the same page. So they define social prescribing which they say sometimes known, known as community referral, is no longer true. Like people don't call it community referral anymore. It's a means of enabling health professionals, clinicians, to refer patients to a range of local non-clinical services. So it's not like a hospital refer to polyclinic or a polyclinic refer to even a, a acute hospital or uh, all the care, tertiary care centers. It's about non-clinical services and of course, a large part of non-clinical services are provided by community care providers. So uh, WHO has also been advocating for social prescribing. So we are very fortunate to be part of this. Uh, we were invited to help to contribute some technical information to this toolkit on how to implement social prescribing. This is available online, but I, think I, I really like what they, how they define social prescribing. They, they define it as Again, same thing, a means of healthcare workers to connect patients to a range of non-clinical services. Now they emphasize in the community. And for what purpose, they say, to improve health and well-being. So of course, that begs the question, what is health and well-being, right? Okay. Okay, so now very close to this uh, is this concept of social determinants of health. So, uh, Sing Health Community Hospital, when we wanted to implement a social prescribing plan, a, a program, we realized that we need to have a definition. And this definition will guide our action. So, we think we need something uh, more tangible in the sense that we can follow this uh, philosophy as we try to implement social prescribing. So, we say, let's follow this thing called the context, mechanism, and outcome approach because this will help us to evaluate how effective we are. So this follows the uh, evaluation framework. Huh? Context, the context of social prescribing is in the context of social determinants of health, which needs definition, which explanation. Huh? The second part is the mechanism. The mechanism is to connect people to community assets. Okay. And then what is the outcome you want? You want people to improve their well-being. Okay, so let's uh, Let's uh, break down this and uh, dissect this down a little bit. Huh? Let's talk about context for social determinants of health. So you see, uh, doctors and clinicians like yourself have always been trying very hard to help patients, right? But you will realize that most of the time, I would dare say, uh, we do not reach the optimal results. Be it control of diabetes, prevent complications, uh, get them well cared for after they develop major illnesses and so on, is really always suboptimal. And if you really think through, uh, why did it not follow through well enough? Because after all, your hospital, your clinic, your nursing home, whatever you are, are very good, right? State of the art, among the best in the world. And all of you, and including myself, hopefully, are well trained. Uh, we go through CME, we make sure our skills are up to date, and we are really tip top. And then also uh, we have uh, we follow evidence-based treatment. Oh, uh, well, thankfully as much as possible. So everything we do nicely. Uh, why things still don't go the way we want them to go for the sake of our patients and the outcome? 
Well, the reason is it follows this theory of social determinants of health. Under optimal conditions, no matter how hard we try or how perfect our healthcare system is, it only tends to 20% of the impact on a person's health and well-being. The other 80% are in the conditions where they are born, where they grow up, where they work, where they study, where they grow old, and where they live. So essentially, these are called social determinants of health. It's all out there. Right? That determines the ultimate outcome. Much as we try our best to help the patients with our evidence-based medicine and our professional training. So therefore, it's logical that we should somehow think that maybe we should try our best or even at least try a little bit to improve this other 80%. That's where social prescribing comes in. right? So how do we do that? We find out what they need in terms of the social determinants of health. And thereafter, we give them a prescription by linking them to the community assets that can help them in the social determinants of health. So conceptually, it's quite simple, right? So poor social determinants of health, not getting a good outcome, connect you to community assets with social prescribing to improve the outcome. And then what's the outcome? Outcome is well-being. So well-being is more than just absence of disease or even absence of disability. Right? WHO, when it was formed in 1948, says that health is more than just lack of disease or disability is in a state of physical, biological, that means bi biological, psycho, psychological and social well-being. That's biopsychosocial approach. So this is what the outcome we want to achieve. So let me then uh, tell a little bit more about social prescribing, right? Okay, so now we have a clinical prescription and we have social prescription. Together, they complete the healthcare plan. So what is clinical prescription? Clinical prescription is like, for example, what do we prescribe in a clinical prescription? We prescribe medicine, we prescribe uh, maybe all the relevant investigations, and maybe we even prescribe surgery and procedures. So this is a clinical prescription. So what does social prescrib prescription contain? Social prescription contains a prescription for the kind of activities they should do that will improve their well-being. And also, uh, we also talk in terms of the kind of community assets that we can bring them to, as well as to, uh, as well as to uh, link them to the services that they need. So together, this will complete the social uh, healthcare plan. So then, when we do that, how do we then? What do we really aim for? So when what we try to aim for really is the state of well-being, and for that we use the concept of uh, what is called PERMA in the positive psychology. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, there's some background noise. I'll need to move out towards another space. So we need to talk in terms of uh, social uh, the elements of well-being, right? Which is, we follow the concepts of positive psychology. So it goes by the acronym of PERMA, positive emotions, engagement, relationship, meaning, and achievement. So positive emotion means that we are in a state of happiness, contentment, gratitude, and so on, right? Uh, of, as opposed to negative emotions, which is anger, jealousy, anxiety, and so on. So when a person is in a positive emotional state, they are in a state of well-being. Engagement means they are doing activities that are meaningful to them and makes them feel engaged. For relationship, is uh, because we are all social creatures, we want to have in a state of good social interaction that contributes to our well-being. And we also want to have meaning beyond what we are, what we have in life, um, things that are greater than ourselves. And we need a sense of achievement, things that we do that we are proud of, that we think that we have done well. So these are elements that help us to guide our actions to help a patient achieve uh, uh, well-being. So to do this, we need to find the community assets because we need to link patients to community assets, right? So for that purpose, we say that we follow the concept of the asset-based community development. That means, supposing now we have a prescription for clinical prescription, the person goes to the pharmacy to get it uh, materialized. If we have a social prescribing plan, it means we say that uh, you should uh, take up exercises that are suitable for you, 
you should uh, become less, try to have more social interaction with people because loneliness is really bad for your well-being and your health. And we say you need to good, you need to have good nutritious food. You need somewhere where you can be supported in this. So to achieve this, we have to find community assets and then we have to link it up to them. So that, and how do we find that? We need to have a good, we need to have a good uh, asset map where we list down all the community assets and we can recommend the patients and even help them to close the last mile so that they can actually uh, get their social prescription honored in the, with the community assets. All right, sorry, got to change space again. Okay, sorry about that. So how do we practice? So as you can see, it's not easy, very much like clinical pres uh, prescription. It all starts off with a good, a good uh, engagement that the patient really, you know really what the patient needs. Because just like clinical prescription and even more so, we need to contextualize the prescription to the patient's needs. And then you have to build a relationship. You have to think of the activities that you want to link the patients with when they leave and go back to the community. And you also need to find the community assets to link them and thereafter really link them up. And even then, more importantly, to close the last mile and to link the patients to the actual community assets to make sure that it actually happens. Right. So it's actually a series of things I need to do. And uh, it's not going to be easy, of course, uh, especially when we are talking about primary care, right? You're out there on your own, you're barely making things, barely surviving all the new administrative pressures that you are, that are faced with as you try to implement healthy SG and there we say, oh, go and link to the community. How, when, how, where, who is going to help me? Where are the assets and so on, right? So uh, I think we fully understand that. That's why the RHS are supposed to support the GPs and all the, all the three RHSs have different approach, but essentially the core elements are the same. Support primary care, provide them with community nurses, link them up with community partners, and then to get care coordinators, people who are trained in social prescribing to help you uh, do this social prescribing part. So, and these teams, at least for the Sing Health model, will be placed in the active aging centers, co-located with them to help them support. Right? So, uh, okay, sorry. So now, so what do you do when you want to do social prescribing? So as part of your history taking, we need to go a little bit more. We need to understand a little bit about the social determinants of health. That means where's the housing environment, uh, the finances, if they have difficulties, access to good healthy food, do they are actually able to follow that advice that you give or the nurse educator give, uh, help them to achieve social connections if they are very lonely and isolated. Who are the caregivers that can help to take care of them? as well as to uh, how to help them to access healthcare. And uh, these days, digital inclusion is so important because most of the things now are through the phone and through the, through the uh, mobile apps, right? So if they are excluded, they are in the poor state of social determinants of health. And then also to guide them to where the community assets are. And all these plans is sort of guided by our understanding of what is well-being through the concept of PERMA, positive emotions, things that they can get engaged in, relationships that are important, things that are defined meaningful, or in other words, what matters to them, as well as to the kind of small steps of achievement that you can help them to achieve so that they feel a sense of uh, well-being, that they are on a path to better health. So what do they do? So people who do social prescribing out there who will help you are trained in these areas. They can assess the social determinants of health, they can work out a social prescribing care plan with the person and they can look for activities that can link people up to improve their well-being as well as they can follow up patients on the clinical care plan that you have and then they can report back to you what's going on because they're out there in the community supporting these patients and they can help you to support adherence to your clinical care plan and also to help you connect to community nurses and colleagues in the RHS. So if you are committed and say, I may want to try this social prescribing thing that you talk about, uh, there is this actually a community of practice where people who have been trained or practice social prescribing come together. 
So uh, this could be something that you want to consider. Uh, there's one right now that's organized called the Singapore Community of Practice in Social Prescribing. So uh, whenever there are experts in this area that come down to Singapore, uh, we will organize an event. So recently in August, we have this uh, strong advocate and expert in social prescribing that came down from the UK. So we organized a masterclass and it was very well attended. We opened it up to members of the uh, intermediate and long-term care sector as well. Then, of course, we also run many causes. Causes that are for, for clinicians, causes that are for people in the community and even medical students. And also, uh, we collaborate with institutions of higher learning so that we can have a pathway of training for people who are interested. Now, for people who are, so many of you have already your own original skills in certain areas. So for people with a certain skill set, uh, you may not need to do everything. So you can pick and choose com uh, causes that work around competency framework and you can then decide which are the ones that you want to top up. And if you link them all up or we call stacking them up, you can even get a qualification at the end of it through our connections with institutions of higher learning like Nian Polytechnic or uh, Singapore Uni University of Social Science. So these are causes. If you scan this QR code, you can actually get more details of causes like this. This is an example of a WSQ uh, accredited course where you can actually use your skills future funding to pay for some of these causes that we are running. And uh, that comes to the end of my presentation. And if you really want to find out more, so sorry for the technical interruptions. If you really want to find out more, there's this website, uh, www.socialprescribingoneword.sg. So down there, you'll find a lot of uh, resources, recorded lectures, uh, both local and by international experts. And we hold regular events. So there's one event that's coming up in the, in the Singapore Museum. Uh, where the emphasis will be on heritage uh, team kind of uh, social prescribing activities. So uh, with that, thank you very much. And once again, apologies for the technical interruptions. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you, King Hawk. Um, yeah, let me put on my glasses. It's very engaging. I've been taking notes. And uh, so just uh, to inform uh, our audience, we have... Um, Prof Lee's permission to record this and we will put on the uh, HNF uh, YouTube channel for to share. So I'm sure all of you are like me, very uh, enlightened and excited about the, the teachings that he has shared and linking uh, the social determinants on health to what we all want to achieve, which is health and well-being of the people that we take care of. As doctors, we call them patients. Um, so uh, I'd like to open the floor to uh, Q&A. So we have a Q&A tab. I, currently, I don't have any open uh, questions. Are there anyone from the audience? If you like, you could uh, raise your hand. And uh, okay, yes, there's one question. Uh, um, uh, I'll read out. It's from the chat. Uh, Prof. Lee, thank you for your sharing in your experience. How can we incorporate social prescribing into our already packed consultation or in the home care setting, I'll, I'll visit with many agendas. Yeah, so this is very, very tough. Huh? So to be very honest, I think it's not easy. <laughs> I'm a very uh, strong advocate. Sorry, by the way, is there any background noise that you're hearing? Huh? Because it's quite noisy. Um, It's very light. We are not very affected, but I am aware oh. that you are more affected than us. Sorry, sorry. I'm in a public place. So <laughs> apologies. So now, okay, I think <laughs> yeah, it is. All right. Okay, good. Thank you. So really tough. I mean, to be honest, uh, I may be, I may sound like a hypocrite, uh, but if I don't admit to this, uh, when I'm in, I'm running my own clinic, uh, and it's so busy sometimes, and there are thousand and one things to sort out, uh, including electronic medical records, reconciling prescription is already such a headache, and then, ah, uh, I think it's sometimes quite quite challenging, and unfortunately, yeah. this type of patients need social prescribing most. Yes. Then I have to really say, okay, I got to press the pause button, let time slow down, and think in terms of the social determinants of health. Now, sometimes it's worth it because if you just quickly, quickly do your busy, busy things, uh, you will find that things that trip you up outside will come back to haunt you. You'll find that oh, the patient yes. don't understand the medicine, cannot go to exercise because uh, he just doesn't have that 
access to a place where they can do the slow jogging or the brisk walking that you talk about. He cannot follow your meal advice because he works as a security guard and he works in shifts. And the food he gets is either the hawker center upstairs or nothing else. The healthy yeah. food is very expensive. He cannot afford it. That will cost about 50% of his salary if he follows your advice for healthy living. Yeah. And uh, he's very lonely because of his odd hours, he's broken contacts. Now, if you, if you just go through this without knowing this or trying at least to help them in this area, then you'll find that his HGA1C is not well controlled and you get frustrated and say, I'm giving you all the evidence-based medicine really, right? Yeah. Why is it like that? Why are you so non-compliant or non-adherent? But the truth yeah. is, now supposing if you've taken the time to understand the context, I'm not going to say it's going to solve the problem, right? But at least you yeah. know where the problem is to start with. You have done the 20% very well. Congratulations, right? But the 80% yeah. is what messes up. How to do that if you don't know it? At least yeah. if you know, know it, there's a chance. Now, of course, then you don't have the time or the, or the sometimes even expertise. Huh? So then what do we do uh, is that we provide you with a person who's, who has, can spend time doing social prescribing. Yeah. So in our community hospital, in addition to the multidisciplinary team, we have someone who do social prescribing. We will talk yeah. to the patient, focusing on these areas, reporting back to the multidisciplinary team and follow the patients out and to seek out things that can help him. So yeah. for example, using the same case, right? You say, okay, in your case, uh, ah, I realize, uh, yeah, it's very tough, but oh, do you know that there was this park that is near you? I think uh, there is actually a group, Tai Chi, that does X, Y, Z days, you know, maybe you can try. And then when you do that, maybe if they can interact, they're not so lonely, right? Or yeah. uh, food-wise, oh, there's this community kitchen, which is going to sprout out all across Singapore, right? At least go yeah. there, have a few good meals and uh, maybe try to ex explain how he can follow in, how he can implement the good advice that the nurse educator or the dietitian has given him. So all yeah. this needs to be followed up. So I think this is the eighty percent that we want to work on to, yeah, to yeah. really leverage. So very tough, but I think worth the effort. Uh, and hopefully more and more resources will be available to you to support you. So if I'm hearing correctly, King Ho, you're, you're using another kind of manpower who is trained if i'm if i understand correctly you're referring to the link workers right so the doctor may not have the time to decipher the actual social needs but you know this person seems to be at risk and you refer to a link worker so um but there's a an audience asking a question which is related to what we're discussing about how do you identify people who need them i mean is there anyone practicing a kind of a screening mechanism a triaging mechanism that you know of yeah okay but how do we so, identify people at risk of social yeah uh, yes okay, so two things uh, manpower we know is not very tough right okay so let me talk about uh yeah. the second part first is how do you know so that's where the training comes in what we do is we train them in the competencies yes. that i tell you right having a conversation uh of course we say uh, ask the yeah. patient what matters to him or her but this is very yeah. philosophical, right? It's very hard to ask. So what we do is we teach yeah. them to ask about the PERMA concepts. We talk to them, what ah, are the okay. things that make you feel happy recently? What do you do? What do you find meaningful to you? And then we think of activities yeah. that trigger positive emotions. So these are proposed. Yeah. Then at the end of this conversation, in the, in the, in, we have a, a form that we use modified from the college's SBA4 that incorporates social determinants of health as well. So you identify uh, okay. Now, uh, it's not a tool like Interi or iCOPE, uh, which is very technical, yeah. maybe a little bit too focused yeah. on the biomedical aspects, uh, but this one is purely yeah. on social determinants of health. And thereafter, we can think of activities and then they start thinking of assets. And in our training, yeah. we also teach them how to look for assets in the community to help patients how to help patients search. And it ah. gets easier, easier with apps. Uh. And we cannot afford to get nurses, doctors, therapists, social workers to do this area, although they are more than competent if we give them, just point them in the right direction. But the truth is there's not enough yes. such people. There's, so what we are tapping on are uh, mature workers, people with a lot of life yep. experience with the right traits. And we just need to train yes. them in certain aspects of their competency needed and give them a few tools. Ah. And usually, 
it happens. I have seen it in action. So I'm very encouraged by to see some of my link workers in Singapore. We call them well-being coordinators. The impact yes. they have on patient is just so amazing. You know, someone who's uh. grumpy, totally demoralized, and after that few sessions with the well-being coordinator, they started taking positive action. You know, go to the senior activity yeah, yeah. center, become very active, ask for more uh, services that is relevant to them. So it works. Uh, it takes effort, and we need to think of a very, a very sustainable way of resourcing such an activity and such a model. Yeah, thanks, King. You actually address the training of the well-being coordinator somewhat. But what the question I have was, as a busy GP, right? How do you identify among the so many people that you're seeing every day, and also people long queue waiting outside? How do you? Um, sort of uh, screen for okay, this person I need to get the well being coordinator in. This person, well, I just deal with um, the rest of the seat, chronic disease management. I mean, or do you sort of refer everyone to a well being coordinator? Uh, uh, think, regardless, is there a criteria? Targeted, targeted is always better now. Okay. Now, the, the beauty of it now is under healthy SG, uh, there's this the, everyone has a health plan, right? And in the health plan, there is a social care plan as yes. well. And if we do it yes. well, oh. what it's what happens is that for every senior at least that come to us, right, we are going to link them to the active aging centers, right? Yes. Yeah. Now in these active aging centers, there are community connectors who are now called social connectors. Working yes. with AIC, we give them a very sh quick one point five days of training. Uh, not yes. Specifically for social prescribing, but very rich in the principles of social prescribing. Yes. So these are the people who can carry out and co-develop the social care plan that you have. Ah, so, okay. Yeah, so I think the pieces are in place. Is I think it's going to get better and better as we get more and more confident in the model as well as the competency that we need to train people in. Ah, so this is related to a question by Dr. Tia Bun Yin. She said that... Mm. Um, where can we get an asset map for services around our area? Um, yeah. Is it from the active aging centers or is there a centralized database for these services? The mm. EIC Silver Services website are rather fragmented. So yeah. do you know of any um, asset mapping? Is it yeah. publicly aware? Yeah, known. Okay. Yeah, so we have this same problem. So I, I train my well-being coordinators and they go out and say, then they come back to me, hey, Prof, you talk nonsense. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> all this theory doesn't work because I, I believe you I can I can get all this done but outside I can't find any assets oh, yeah. uh, but the trouble is it is there but you do not know it sometimes uh, it is not okay. even in Google Map and sometimes it's not even in the AIC listed one it could be very informal things that are out there that nobody knows because we yeah. all believe in ABCD right we know that yeah. individuals have gifts communities help themselves there are a lot of informal mm -hmm. assets that we don't know so what we do now we have embarked on the project so yes. we believe the previous kind of maps all doesn't work because it's all top down. Yeah. A group of people get very energized. They go, they take Google map and they try to plug things in and they have a good map for once. And then within the next 20 minutes, it becomes outdated already. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, no more energy, no more funding. So it's not sustainable. So what we do is we realize, you know, you take look at Wikipedia and all that, right? Yeah. We think it has to be crowdsourced. Yeah. It has to be a controlled crowdsource by committed practitioners who actually use it. Yeah. And as they use it, uh, they will find assets. And when they find an asset, don't waste it. Because only yeah. you know about it, right? Share it and put it onto a digital map. That oh. is open, not to the public, but to only practitioners. Why we don't want to have the public? Because if it's the public, uh, it has to be very rigorous. No? Yeah. And you will get criticized yeah. if they decide to close at 8.30 instead of 9 p.m. or 9 a.m. Or oh, then you get all sorts of feedback yeah. and flag. And then you say, oh, your government agency, how come it's not accurate? Here you say, okay, own cell, own cell, help own cell, right? If it's wrong, it's because yeah. of our own fault, right? Can we yeah. all as members try to make it better? So, this, so we are very fortunate. Uh, MCCY has given us a small funding to test this concept. I think the thing that really makes us very hopeful is SLA is on board. Yeah. To one map, right? So yeah. I think we're going to have this and we managed to convince them it's not the one map kind of approach, top down, very heavy on resource, huh? but to yeah. use controlled crowdsourcing, create something to share among a group of community or practice practitioners. Yeah. 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 So that's so, the approach. 
So this information, okay, I, I get you and I know the, the rationale, is now only available to practitioners. Um, so they have to be like registered um, social prescribing or part of this community, like the social coordinators of AACs or the well-being coordinators. Um, then they can have access to this map. Are you saying that? Yeah, I think it's uh, all contributors will have access to the, to the map. Uh. Okay. Right? And, uh, I suppose when it becomes very popular, we have to think of a way to control the access. Very much, ah. uh, there'll be a group of users and there will be a group of people who, who edit it. Uh, so very much like uh, Wikipedia, but uh, yeah. we haven't really figured out actually how to make it widely available, which I think if it's too widely available, it will kill the project. You know? Because yes. then it will evolve back into an official program with all yeah. the very bureaucratic ways of uploading and editing and so on. That will kill it actually. So to keep it informal, I think it's probably better. Small but informal. Ah, so the GPs, do they have access to it? I think if they really want to use it or want to need to use it, they probably have to make a commitment, say, I want to join the community. Ah, okay. So because uh, we have an anonymous attendee sharing that, actually there are some um, uh, doc GPs already given the assets, uh, asset map, and also SG, uh, civil generation ambassadors are also doing uh, a lot of outreach and social prescribing kind of directed work. Yeah, yeah. there are lots of such maps. Uh. I think yeah. there's no exclusivity. I think uh, the uh, more the merrier, right? As long as it works for you. So we hope ours will be just a better version uh, that supports uh, people who need it. Uh. Thank you so much. I have uh, a few questions pertaining to HNF. As, we, as you know, HNF um, is a lot of clients are homebound. And uh, some patients are attending the our senior care centers and also our AACH, the active aging uh, care hubs. So um, with regards to the frail population, maybe the CFS 67 or 567, you know, um, is there, uh, uh, how would you approach the, the social determinants of health or social prescription need for these group of people? I, so there's a temptation to say, can we have a tool that is very objective and structured? Yeah. So that's, that's always a struggle. But again, once you go down that path, it comes with its own trade-off. Yeah. So uh, I think sometimes the un untidy way will be better to say uh, that just have a guided conversation yes. using a framework. So you're not under pressure to check the box or yeah, fit the yeah. patient into a form. You just focus, really hyper-focus on the patient's needs. No? And you have a conversation, then very naturally you're guided. You ask about all the... So in this, so what we do, we don't have a form to fill. We yes. have a framework to guide conversations. Yes. Talk okay. about housing. You know, talk about your yeah. nutrition and diet. Talk about your social economic status. How oh, money enough or not. There's no fixed question to ask. But you're really trying and very curious to find out what is the state of this person's social determinants of health. Yeah. And I think that is... Uh, I find it more effective than using uh, very strict forms and yeah. scores to you know scores and all that are good for research and uh, studies. Uh. Mm. But yeah. come to practice, not helpful. Uh. Because yes. if I if I'm a family doctor, if I follow a form that has boxes and all that, I'll be a horrible family doctor. <laughs> yeah. So how would you then overcome the you know, there's a barrier of, I mean, doctors are not trained social workers. Many of us are actually maybe a bit obstructed in our communication or or empathy. You know, we don't really recognize loneliness when just staring at our face. So uh, if we were to um, do a conversation, how do you overcome this issue? I mean, is doctor the best person to do social prescribing or should it be social worker or OT or nurse, or, you know, how do you think about this? Yeah, I think everyone who's in the health and social care cannot yeah. be a very bad person or a very psychopathic kind of person. Honestly, <laughs> we all started wanting to help people, right? So the intrinsic yeah. is always, it's self-selected group of people. Then yeah, the next okay. step, of course, is say, okay, I, so, it, so um, we all know uh, medical students become more, cynical, uh, less patient-centered over time because of this pressure that we keep grinding them for KPIs and past exams and so on, right? So yeah. this is a new risk. So what we say is uh, uh, 
encourage people to go back to their original roots, uh, right? I think yes. that's very, very uh, wishy-washy or wooly-wooly. Uh. But actually, yeah. really, you to reconnect with your own initial beginner's mind when you started your career. Then the next thing Wang is that... <laughs> I'm in China now. Chosing, <laughs> chosing. <laughs> yeah, correct. Hey, that's very wise philosophy. Right? Okay, we yes, always yes. forget. Uh, we always forget. Now, yeah. think, okay, so that's the part, that's the effective part. Now, the next thing is competency also. Yes. Some people are very kind, uh, but they're just all over the place. Uh. So yes. what we do is we adapt a uh, motivational interview. In fact, you can actually use the whole motivational interview approach. It ah, starts okay. off with empathic listening. When you, yeah. when you ask and you talk or you have a conversation, you are really hyper-focused and interested in what is going on yeah. with this patient rather yes. than uh, what I need out of this conversation to fill up 20 forms by this morning or you know all the things that we need to do, right? That's, yeah. that's, that's where it sort of blocks the uh, communication. And of course, this kind of skills can be trained uh, or yeah. really actually reinforced uh, because most of us already have some innate skills in this aspect already. Or maybe certain prescriber selection uh, because some people really just cannot have it. But I'm just wondering, so what you're saying is that you need both. Uh, one is competency. Another one is in the semi-structured approach uh, because you mentioned about the guided communication is also like a semi-structure, right? Mm. Yeah, so that we won't miss out on things. Yeah. You, you yeah. must be guided. It cannot be all over the place kind of chit-chat. Uh, yes, obviously. yes. So in a way, if I were to have a patient who is like, homebound, wheelchair-bound, living with a maid all the time, although she longs to go out to certain places, uh, but there's just no one to got the time or money to bring her, because maybe money is not an issue. But um, So if I were to be a visiting doctor or a nurse, if I were to do social prescribing, is even as I'm doing my clinical duties, I actually communicate with the person to identify what is the, the needs, right? And then particularly with the psycho and human connectedness kind of needs, then I would think that I should connect this person to something else, like a, uh, maybe uh, so so is this how it works? So I I'll think of a uh, maybe somebody bring them for yam cha or somebody to come to the house and do some activities with them or mahjong or something. Is this how social prescribing look like in home care? Uh, for home care. It's challenging because uh, they are in home care because they have this mobility issue. They cannot get out of the house, right? Yes. Yeah. So that makes it very challenging. So to the extent that you can en uh, encourage that will be good. Uh, of course, visitor by befrienders is also another solution. Yes. But it cannot be too technical. Like I've seen uh, I've seen the way things, sometimes people go around uh, matching befrienders. Uh, it just doesn't work. Uh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just it's a chemistry kind of thing, right? Uh, yes. So I think it's not easy. I'm just saying yeah. that uh, you have to really understand the patient to see what are the potential sources of social connection. Yes. And the social connection usually come up through activities. Yes. So there is no one size fit all. Everyone has certain potential and certain challenges. And some mm -hmm. are really so challenging. Uh, it's really, I must say that it's like, it's same as clinical prescription. Uh, sometimes it's just can't think of a way. But you may need antidepressant. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> but yes. some some have missed opportunities, you know. I think uh, if yeah. you connect back, sometimes you can think of ways to connect. And there's worst case scenario, uh, sometimes pet therapy is very good. Yes, <laughs> yes. Sentient being connection is need not be human to human. Yes. A yeah. ghost, maybe. <laughs> no, ah, that's joking. Exactly. Yeah. No, no, it's not so much that you, sometimes that's that spiritual connection, right? Yes. Prayers. Oh, prayers. You know, yes, going yes. to the temple medium to connect with your long dead. Yes. Friend. Yes. Yeah. So some people may really need that. Okay. That's um. We have very limited time left, but there's a question here. Not really a question, but it can be a kind of question. Do you think community case management can do the work? of social prescribing or meeting the social needs with the GPs? Can they link clients up with the AACs and community resources? So the uh, follow-up from my, from me is like uh, sometimes, you know, this help well-being prescriber or, or coordinator, the role is very close with the case manager and perhaps sometimes the social worker. So how do you see this? How do you differentiate? Or do you need to differentiate all? Yeah. One, one more group uh, is the health coaches also. They say, oh, this is yes. health coaches. Health coaches 
Yeah, and yeah. some OTs also. Yeah. yeah correct. <laughs> Anybody can do it. So the last thing we want to do uh, is to have a body of license, uh, like medical practitioner must have license. Oh, yeah, and please. Do, uh, <laughs> social prescribing. So we yes, say yes. anybody can do it. If you have the right heart, you want to do it, please go ahead. Anyway, there's not much money to be made out of this, right? Yeah, but correct. In, in any case, what we do is that it's not to say uh, only social prescribing is a way. Social prescribing is a model, a concept to say that we need to attend to the social determinants of health to improve yeah. the health and well-being of people. And yes. to do this, uh, there are many skill sets. And yes. this skill set, uh, some people already do it for donkey years. Already. I mean, the most misunderstood people probably is the social workers. They have been yes. doing social prescribing uh, yeah. as unsung heroes <laughs> for the longest time. Yes. <laughs> but why do you call it social prescriptions? Some of them were quite angry with me. They say, oh, you're yeah, medicalizing yeah. social care. No, I do that further, too. <laughs> it's the furthest from the truth. What we're trying to say that hey, there's this bunch of people who only understand prescription. If yes. you frame it as social prescription, and then you know, ah, oh, okay, clinical prescription, I know. Social yeah. prescription, yeah, makes sense. I think they, we need to formally do this rather than haphazardly try your luck kind of thing, right? Yeah, that's so right. So I bro. think uh, it's so, health coaches can do, case managers can do, social workers can do, doctors, even if they want to slow down their practice can do. Some of them actually yeah. volunteer to work in the community, right? It's actually they're yeah. doing social prescribing as well. Yes. So uh, maybe the last question is related to this. So now that we call it social prescribing, it makes it very clear for doctors. That means there must be indications and contraindications. What would you say are the indications for social prescribing? I mean, to make it clear. And are there contraindications? Probably not. But what are the indications? Everybody needs. So it's like uh, healthy living, right? Yes. Everybody needs it, right? Yeah, it's yeah. how how well we source or how much in need you are in and how sub-optimized it has become of you because of the lack of equity in the healthcare system or the social system. Yes. So everybody needs. So uh, there are many cases, people living in landed property are very lonely, you know. The children yes. are high flyers or they've gone overseas. So there's no say, uh, it's not like, so this is where the uh, analogy or metaphor or prescription falls short, lah. It yeah. doesn't, it's not controlled. Yeah. Well, not only certain people licensed to do it can do it, okay? Yeah. And it's not indicated for specific diseases. It's uh, yeah. everybody yeah. needs it. Uh, so contraindications is just like anything if it's done badly. Usually mm. it's the operator who did not understand the patient well or yeah. don't understand what really matters to the patient, then they buck up the wrong tree, yeah? very much like clinical prescription. Yeah. Thank you so much, King Hot. This is a very fantastic and enriching afternoon that we have with you. Very happy to hear from you and hear from the horse's mouth about social prescribing <laughs> from you. Then, um, so, uh, but this is about the time that we have. So before we close, um, yeah, please allow me to maybe invite uh, Christina to maybe say a few words and then we can close the session. Christina. Hi. Uh Thanks for joining us this Saturday afternoon and thanks for all the participants for dialing in. I hope that the session has been helpful for all of you as it has been for uh, me as well. And certainly, I think we are at the starting of um, understanding the health and social connect and how important it is for us to spend interest and effort to improve the overall well-being of our patients especially those who are frail and isolated. I think there's a lot more work and um, understanding that can go into making um, the quality of life better as well. So for Home Nursing Foundation, we have been looking after frail end-of-life care, uh, homebound patients, but we also have senior care centres and active ageing centres where we see the robust and well seniors who we want to really do preventive health and also make sure that they have the capacity mm -hmm. and capability of taking care of themselves as they age. Okay. Um, so with thank you very much for joining us. And I hope that uh, you will continue to also participate in our future uh, webinars that will aim to improve the overall knowledge and capabilities of our long-term care sector in taking care of patients. Thank you so much, everyone. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, uh, Prof. Lee. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Christina. Okay, bye -bye. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.